There was always the must, uh, Ali Shah, I always remember, you know, Ali Shah, one of the five favorites, who was uh, uh, very Jamali and very useful to Baba and uh, lived in Abhinagar. Baba would call him in all sorts of occasions um, and he was very distinguished looking must and he had an impressive bearing and people who didn't know thought he was some sort of a great man of the world. Um, but, the, but the downside to that was when he had to take a pee he would just pull up and let fire irrespective of who was there. So it's very, very humiliating for the Mandalay. You know, they, they, <laughs> he would completely blow it. And I heard Muhammad the Musk, you remember him, he intensely disliked Ali Shah. They're both on the fifth plane. I think it was a one-way animosity. I never heard that Ali Shah reciprocated. But he would go and start backbiting Ali Shah, and he would criticize him on this very point that he would, it was unsanitary. I mean, Muhammad the Musk, Complaining that someone is unsanitary <laughs> its the most ridiculous thing I can imagine. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, sort of like, a, you know, a chimney sweeper complaining that someone's clothes were dirty or something, you know. Mayor Baba's Tiffin Lectures. So this is a new collection of uh, what we really regard as Baba's words. Um, it's uh, been 20 years in the making. It's a little bit embarrassing how long it took. It was a, it's been a huge uh, project, you know, research and editing and a project to come up with this volume. Uh, and I'll be talking more about the history of the uh, manuscript and its finding and all those sorts of things in due course. Uh, but what it is is a uh, record of the um, like the talks that Baba gave to his men Mandali uh, in 1926 and 1927. Uh, and this is uh, the early Marabad period. I'll be giving this morning actually a history of all of this. But uh, the, uh, what we call the first long stay at Marabad ran from January 1925 until November 1926. Then there was a little interlude, and then there was what we call the second long stay uh, from December 1926 until May 1928. Mm. Yeah. So with that first long stay, he started out speaking. Right. And so there were people who were there when he was speaking, and then they were still there when he began his silence. He passed into silence right in the middle of that stay. And nobody <coughs> expected that he would continue it. He said that he would be silent for a year and they didn't believe it because he was so talkative. You know, Baba really was very vivacious and talked and was energetic. So I think there was skepticism as to whether he would actually get through the year. Um, <laughs> little did they know, 44 years later, it was permanent. So right in the middle of that first long stay and um, Talks uh, were given um, at the uh, center of that period, that uh, first long stay period. That's when they began. They actually ran from April 29th, 1926 until uh, August 30th, 1927, although the great majority of them are in the earlier part of that, 1926. Um, and it was really, really a dynamic period. So what this book really gives you is, I would call it Meher Baba's spiritual training of the men Mandalay. It was really the men. The women and the men were completely apart by then. And uh, it was Baba, this is my understanding, Baba explaining to them a lot of what they were going to need to know over the coming decades of their discipleship with him. So uh, it's like we get to be uh, flies on the wall. Um, listening in on the training, the spiritual training of the men Mandalay. And these are really the hardcore uh, group of his original disciples. Um, you know, I'm sure, Baba never told us who was in his first circle, but I'm sure a bunch of them were there. Um, and 
the, it's not a um, organized collection like a course or anything like that. The sequence of lectures is not especially meaningful. It wasn't like that. Other things were. Uh, we're working right now on a series of talks to the Mayor Ashram boys that were an organized sequence of talks, actually. These aren't. Uh, but they're whatever Baba wanted to talk about that day. Uh, but um, they, they weren't just random chit chat either. Uh, Baba really took them seriously and quite obviously. Uh, the Mandali did too, and uh, they were usually focused on a topic or a theme or a group of closely interrelated themes. Um, and uh, Baba would really um, make sure that they were all getting it. And I would say that the Tiffin lectures are not uh, not difficult. In fact, most people who have, have any of you actually done more than break the cellophane yet? Page 40. Yeah. Page 40. Yeah. All right, right. But you would confirm, right? Okay. Rosie and I, I we're in cahoots here, that it's not, that they're e-readable, right? Yeah, they're Yeah, they're very readable. It's like infinite intelligence is by universal consent, I would say, a challenging book. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. And not a piece of cake. Um, but these are really quite readable and uh, very friendly and they're short, stuff like that. So I think they would make a nice read, actually. So, uh, but when we get into them, when you get into them, you're really entering into the universe of the 1920s, uh, which was a completely different phase of Baba's work um, than uh, that out of which, say, the discourses come, or God speaks. As soon as the Westerners came into the picture, everything changed. And the, Baba's messages took on a very different character. They became, uh, I don't really like the word, but global. I mean, they, they, were, they were at first um, greatly simplified, I would say. No disparagement of the West intended, but uh, the West was not um, focused on uh, spiritual things as its dominant cultural enterprise. It, it, would that be fair to say? Uh, I, I mean, the West was um, highly accomplished in science and arts and many other domains of life, but it had been uh, centuries since uh, religious and spiritual things were really at the center of the cultural discourse. Um, so the interests were not there. So Baba really reoriented the way he framed his message. If you read those early messages Baba gave in 1932, they're fantastic. He speaks right to the Western mind with no condescension or alienness. None of that was there. I mean, Baba really wasn't looking down on people you know, for being this or for being that. And he was instantly right there. And then he built his uh, teachings up again from that point so that with the discourses and God speaks, you really get a very developed and very subtle and very rich uh, edifice of explanation. Um, but he never did exactly go back to what he was giving in the 1920s uh, when he was uh, with the people he had grown up with the culture of his birth. And um, in some ways, I feel uh, but the avatar of the age didn't quite have to mind his P's and Q's <laughs> to the extent that he did uh, after he got to the West. Uh, you know, where they were all looking, oh, he's the Christ. And, you know, he had to make sure he didn't um, offend their ideas of what the Christ was too quickly, you know, or because he, you know, the expectations with him didn't work very well, but he would sort of change them all. So he had to be very uh, careful when he went to the West. That changed too. They, you know, his Western followers and disciples gained maturity with him and he embraced all of that. But in some ways with these uh, young men, I mean, they were in their teens and twenties and he could say what he wanted, you know. <laughs> and uh, 
it, it, so it was, uh, you get that spirit of his um, advent and working with this core of men disciples who were his uh, main team in that respect. I don't know, some, uh, some of you have met like the pa Adi and Padri. Did some of you meet Adi, Padri, yes. Alaba? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, Erich was actually later, of a later vintage. But I mean, uh, actually Alaba was not a disciple then either, but Padre um, Pendu was another. Who else was there from that we would have met? Um, but I mean, they were very um, uh, friendly t to, you know, pilgrims who came. But you could tell that these were men of iron, you know. You could not break them. They were tough. And th this was the crew that accepted Baba as their leader. I mean, I look at somebody like Padre. Who is somebody like Padre going to take as his master? Holy smokes. I mean, there's like nobody who could be the master of a man like that. I don't know if you've got that impression too. Like say, hey Padre, come here. You know, it's like, would, you would not treat him like that. This was a giant. Who could these men have been willing to follow? Nehru Baba. So this was the time that he really was in these, um, it's like in the, uh, in the, among the different aspects of uh, spiritual training. Um, in the, uh, these talks, you're getting a, a, what I would call gyan. Do you know the word gyan? J-N-A-N. Um, it means the intellectual or understanding or um, you know, your worldview, explaining to them for their minds what truth is and what spirituality is. As, a, you know, other aspects would be, you know, obedience and actually doing what he tells you or devotion, the different aspects of spirituality. Well, this would be the, so you might say, training on truth of values, training and understanding uh, that you see here that it's live happening on the spot with them in the room. Gyan, Gyan. Sometimes in uh, uh, older uh, books they'll spell it G-N-Y-A-N. But the current, and in Infinite Intelligence we adopted the spelling that they were using in the, our source text, D-N-Y-A-N. But I, the, the current norm seems to be J-N-A-N. Gyan. Yeah, 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 yeah. They have uh, like four or five different ends in the Indic languages with different letters for each. So then that's the, uh, uh, the text we're going to be looking at. And as in the past, and as many of you seem to uh, know, I, uh, I myself like it better um, if... Uh, People feel free to chime in or speak up. Now that may, you know, it, in the, Charlie, would it be helpful if somebody does that if I repeat what the person says? Okay, I'll try to do that. And remind me if I don't, so that we can get it again on the video. Um, but for you guys just to have to sit there and listen to me drone on all day at a certain point, it, it's sort of as helpful if you could, you know, if you have something to say, to say it. I mean, it makes it livelier and also you may feel more like you have a, you're taking part in the whole thing. Okay, so feel, feel free. I'd like it to be um, informal. Okay, you ready to launch into it? Let me just, oh, uh, I'd like to actually read through the little write-up I did. I don't recall whether uh, this ever got sent out in exactly this form, uh, but I think this would give a good introduction to what we're going to be doing. Uh, Thursday Tiffin Lectures is the title embossed on the front cover of an original manuscript collection of talks that Meher Baba gave to his Min Mandali between 29th April 1926 and 30th August 1927. During this period of the first great efflorescence of the Maribad ashram, Meher Baba's early male followers were passing through the rigors of intense spiritual trainings, training in the ways of his discipleship. 
Throughout the course of this program, Mihir Baba complimented the intense labor and active service that his men were rendering with his own personal explanations on a wide range of topics. Most of these lectures took place on Thursdays, Guruvar or Guru's Day, thus Thursday Tiffin lectures, right? Guruvar means uh, Guru's Day, and that's the name of Thursday in Gujarati, Hindi, so forth. Uh, at the family quarters on the edge of Erangon village or other sites at Mirabad. Um, now, for those of you, how many have been at Mirabad one time or another? Most of you have. Um, you may know the uh, dispensary, the Mirabad dispensary on the edge of Erangon village. There's another hospital in the back of Mirabad. I don't mean that. Have you, do you know where the dispensary is, any of you? Yeah, it's by the road, and you're kind of into the village now. Well, that was the uh, site of um, what was called the family quarters. Uh, and uh, a whole bunch of people lived there over the years. I think the Kalcheri family did. Not Bao, but the rest of his family. And I think Ramesh Jungli did. And it seems like everybody and his brother lived there at one time or another. But this was the first use of that, um, where uh, Kaka Shahani, one of Baba's uh, uh, disciples, I would say, uh, was living there. So Baba would go there on Thursdays with his mandali. In these intimate settings, Baba's early men would gather around him as he discoursed, first with chalk and slate, and later through the alphabet board. You know that for a year and a half, Baba was writing, right? Do you, you're aware of that? Uh, this is before. Right after his silence, he would actually write with Chuck and Slate. And then in 1927, he gave that up too. Uh, on themes and subjects that they were going to need to understand during the years and decades ahead. Records of the talks were noted down by Baba's secretary, Chanji. This was indeed a unique one-time opportunity. After this brief period, Meher Baba never again gave such sustained and concentrated attention to the knowledge or gyan aspect of the training of his Eastern disciples. Baba was really focused on them at this time. After this period, they were kind of on their own, right? <laughs> Baba would be focused on everyone but them, and they had to sort of do their job, and if they, you know, it wasn't easy being Baba's Mandali, but he really got personalized f work with them for this period. Uh, prepared under the auspices of the Avatar Meher Baba Trust and just released by Sharia Foundation, Tiffin Lectures affords readers today with the opportunity to become, as it were, flies on the wall, listening in on these charged sessions between the Avatar of the Age and his first generation of Mandalay, conducted by Ward Parks, one of the editors of Tiffin Lectures. This is talking about this very session. This, the two-day seminar at Mirabod gives introduction to this new original collection of words and messages by the avatar of the age, the great majority of which have never been made public before. The first part of the seminar that will be through what follows this this morning, will review the history of the early Mirabad ashram in the late 1920s and the discourses and messages which Meher Baba gave out then, including his book, In God's Hand, Infinite Intelligence, Tiffin Lectures, Baba's series of explanations to the Mir Ashram boys in 1927-28, and his articles in the Meher Message, published between 1929 and 1931. All of this was discourse material Baba gave out during this late Marib uh, early Mirabad period. The heart of the seminar will be devoted to close reading and immersion in selections from the Tiffin lectures themselves, which delve into themes and subjects of many kinds. The final segment will survey the sources used in the compilation of Tiffin Lectures. This will be uh, tomorrow, the later part. The editorial principles employed in the authentication and establishing of its text 
and the basis for asserting that the words and messages in this book can rightly be attributed to Meher Baba's authorship. I really do feel um, a, a commitment to um, uh, talking about this. Uh, and I find that even though most of Baba's lovers are not textual scholars, I would, that's a safe statement, and even though there might be some, the, if you've ever looked at the endnotes in this book, there are like 50 or 60 pages of dense textual endnotes. And it's possible that you might skip one or two of those in the course of your reading of the Tiffin lectures. Um, despite that, I do find that most Baba lovers really do care about the underlying issue, uh, which is uh, this is being presented by the Avatar Mirababa Trust as a collection of Mirababa's words. Well, are they really Mir Baba's words, and on what basis do you say that? And I think that is a very fair question and a very good question. And um, uh, I do find that Baba's lovers, not our, many are concerned about that question and are quite capable of understanding the essential principles of the whole thing. And I myself feel it's really important in our Baba culture to have an understanding of this because there's every likelihood in uh, the coming years and decades that all kinds of nonsense is going to get put out there saying Mir Baba said this and Mir Baba said that and uh, people will need to have some critical awareness uh, about this and I think it's helpful to know that there actually is a major branch of scholarship devoted exactly to questions of this kind. It's textual scholarship, which happens to be my field. Now just the fact that I'm a textual scholar doesn't mean that I've done a good job. It may be utter nonsense anyway. But, so you don't have to just believe what anybody says. But I just wanted to put it, you know, uh, explain a little bit about all of this, which I actually do find Baba lovers to care about. Maybe not everyone, but many do. <clears throat> since, uh, let's see, since Tiffin Lectures has only just been published, the presentation will, will be framed in terms accessible to participants who have not read the book, like everyone here. Mm -hmm. Although I've read the book, I think I can say that. The publication of Tiffin Lectures nonetheless stands as a signal event. These lectures will almost certainly occupy an important place in the body of Avatar Mihrababa's core messages and discourses for centuries to come. So this is an exciting moment in the history of the dissemination of the Avatar's message to the world. All are cordially welcomed and invited to attend. No prior background is necessary. And if you have some question or point you want to bring up, um, don't feel embarrassed that, oh, this is a stupid question or things like that. A lot of times, uh, you know, the stupid questions are precisely the questions that other people have got to. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, flowering, burgeoning, blossoming. Yeah. The, this was, that was the word used up earlier about the efflorescence of the Maribad ashram. And as I'll be going over, this was a booming period for early Maribad. It's amazing all that went on, starting 1925 for about three or four years. And then Baba kind of closed it down to a considerable extent. And now these are the general topics. So uh, I just did this up. I mean, we'll see how closely we stick to this, but uh, this morning I was going to start with a history. Here, let me I can expand some of it. I think most of the slides will be more readable. The history of the early Mirabad Ashram, 1923 to 1929, and then literary works from the early Mirabad period. Uh, there was really a lot of discoursing that Baba did, and also a lot of the Mandali were... Uh, uh, compiling diary material. There's really quite a bit of it. And then these are just some topics. I'm not at all sure I'm going to follow it in this way. But um, okay, well, I'll, we'll, we'll come to that when the time comes. And then the last part will be problematics associated with what we call Mir Baba's words. That is to say, if you say these are Mir Baba's words, 
what exactly do you mean? And um, pr one significant point in this respect is that, in fact, Mihir Baba was silent. So he didn't speak any words except for the one word, whatever your view is on that. And that really is relevant to the whole body of material that we call Mihir Baba's words. Um, on the need for critical editions, on the editing of the Tiffin lectures, and transparency in public presentation uh, of Baba's books. And let me just, right now, just show you something we'll look at more um, later, but um, oops, is that going to work? Oh yeah, it is there. Uh, this is up on the, the Trust website and uh, one of the things that we're doing with books like this is that uh, uh, there's going to be different information about it. And um, for example, uh, uh, if you were looking at a particular Tiffin lecture and uh, wanted to uh, see, well, what are the sources for this? There's a lot of stuff in the book itself about that. There's really quite a lot. And one of it would be the endnotes. And if you went onto the website and clicked on EndNotes, and I know that everybody is just dying to know <laughs> where the, the source material for the lecture of 1st July in EndNote uh, 4 is. I know that's, that, that's what brought John Page here. I know this is that very question. Yeah. So you could go right here, and you could click right on that, and it would open. And, uh, the page is there. So all the sources are online and accessible uh, in this way and many other ways. So in the last session, uh, I'll be talking more about some of these things. Part of the purpose of this is being transparent and also it's just to make, this is actually the source material, all this stuff. And this edition has been compiled on the basis of that source material. Yes? Is that source material? Uh, this particular one is a typed up uh, version. This is actually um, TTLFF is the abbreviation. Uh, Thursday Tiffin Lectures from the Phyllis Frederick Collection. This is actually what we regard, came to view as our primary source for Tiffin Lectures. And it appears to be a write-up based on Chanji's diaries, yeah. The whole of uh, Tiffin Lectures um, appears to be based on Chanji's diaries. Um, the diaries are lost after October 1926, so we don't know for sure, but very, very probably, it must have been him, and there's no other real likely candidate. Do you know who Chanji is, by the way? I'll, he, Chanji is, uh, I'll show you a picture of him presently, but Framrose Dada Chanji is his name and he was Meher Baba's secretary from the time that he joined Baba I think in 1924 until he died in 1944 and he was uh, a very industrious secretary indeed he was always taking notes and uh, there were a number of important diarists a diarist, somebody who keeps a diary, um, in the early years. Chanji wasn't the only one. There's Adi and Ramju and Nader Shah and other people. But by far the most important was Chanji. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned that the students at Grand those, those uh, lessons were also recorded. Is that Yeah, he's asking about, I should have to remember to repeat questions, about the uh, uh, talks to the Mir Ashram kids, which is what I'm working on right now. That's the current project. And unfortunately, we haven't found evidence yet as to who took down the notes. So, hmm. You said the yes, notes were lost, so how are they? How are they the uh, Chanji's diaries were, um, are missing uh, from October 1926 on. We have all of the diaries up through then though, which is like, 75% of the Tiffin lectures, so most of it we have. But after that we don't, so.
the sources got lost somehow. But I, I'm very confident they're Chanjis. Everything before that is, for sure. So, um, so did, hmm. uh, did you mention Phyllis Frederick collection? That's what this is from. Yeah, she left her uh, papers with the Pearsons, mm -hmm. and we found um, it was a real shock. I think in 2013, as I was preparing for the Mirana program, and I just asked Chris if I c could have a take a copy of the Mirror Message. That's an early. Uh, magazine published in those days, 1929-1931, just to sort of show to the group in the same way that I just showed you all the Tiffin lectures. And in looking for it, we found this, and it was, if I had been a maiden in a 19th century novel, I would have swooned. <laughs> I practically did as it was. I couldn't believe my eyes, yeah. but we'll come to that presently. Yeah. Yes. So these are Phyllis's notes taken directly from Chanji's diary? No, these are Chanji's di uh, diaries and his types of themselves. Adi sent them to her. Baba told Adi to so send... These are Chan actually Chanji's, Chanji's typing work. Um, it could be. I'm not totally sure who did the typing, but it's Chanji's compilation. Of that I'm quite Somehow sure. Somehow it ended up in Phyllis's. Yeah, uh, I think Baba told Adi to send her second copies of everything. Okay. And the, here's the joke: we have the front, the first copy. The you know when it, some of you are di dinosaurs of my generation, mm -hmm. and we'll remember when we were going to make copies, we would use a carbon oh, copy. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. I think there were still dinosaurs on the earth back then, <laughs> and. Uh, so, you know, you type, 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 and your back would be the carbon copy. So, um, the front top sheet copy uh, of Tiffin Lectures, of the final draft, um, was found at Merizod. I'll be giving that story um, soon. Um, and you would think that the front top sheet copy would be the most important one for textual editors. But if you thought so, you would be wrong. Because the carbon copy got filled in. The diagrams are missing. There are all sorts of blank spaces. They're called lacunae, uh, a gap in a manuscript, uh, to be filled in with handwriting. You, almost always Gujarati script. The, the, the typewriters, of course, didn't have that facility in them, so they would handwrite them. And they didn't do it on the top sheet copy, which we had at Merzad. They did it in the carbon copy. And so I had been racked and tormented for 15 years by not knowing, trying to figure out what those words could be, and using every expedient no imaginable. And then, lo and behold, Phyllis had it all along. It was sent to her. So her copy is more valuable than the original, than the front cover copy is. That was one of the big surprises, as I, as I say. So now, here's coming into some of the history then. So then, a, a lot for this part of the weekend. We're, so get on your, yeah. You know, we can all get on our magic carpets and um, leave Los Angeles 2017. It can take care of itself for a couple hours. And let's uh, go back to Maribad in the 1920s uh, when Mirababa was first uh, making that his ashram. Let me see. So this is what he looked like back in those days. Good-looking devil, wasn't he? So uh, here's some of the, here's a general chronological framework of what we're going to be covering. And I would call this the early Maribad period, 1923 to 1929. May of 1923, Mehrababa visits Maribad for the first time. May uh, 1923 to January 1925. Gamala Yoga. 
and other early settlement activities amidst frequent whirlwind travels. Do you know what Gamala Yoga is? If you, look for, if you buy a standard reference on yoga, uh, you won't find it there. <laughs> you know what a Gamala is? Yeah. Those metal pans, sort of trays, and uh, uh, sort of laborers there. That's kind of very low caste um, work in India. You, you'll see them like building roads or building houses and stuff, and they'll, these metal pans, they'll carry them on their head and throw dirt and, and rocks and stuff like that in construction work like that. Um, that's a gamala. And uh, Mir Baba's uh, early disciples uh, were, for the most part, I would say middle class, verging on upper middle class, say middle class uh, uh, people. Uh, a lot of them were Zoroastrians, and you know the Zoroastrians uh, at that time under the British Raj um, were uh, tended to be very successful and uh, prosperous, not uh, the titans of you know finance. They might be now some of them, but uh, but had done well, and the British also favored them uh, because the British were trying to. Uh, uh, deal with an empire comprised of 80% Hindi, Hindu, 20% Muslim. And uh, the Zoroastrians had the convenient attribute of being neither one of those. <laughs> and uh, also susceptible to being hated from both ends. <laughs> so perfect, right? In other words, they could have a, a minority within India that was very accomplished, very well educated, and that would be loyal. To, to them, the British. So I'm being a little bit cynical, but you know, the British were a bit cynical too. And so um, the Zoroastrians tended to be uh, uh, selected by the British oftentimes to help run the uh, empire in uh, India. Uh, so a lot of these young men were of this uh, uh, religion and of this ethnicity from. Persia originally, and uh, would be expected to have good careers. And uh, m most of them wouldn't go into government. Baba's chums weren't doing that, but they, you know, had rude run businesses and stuff like that. So he had a good core of that. And there were also a bunch of Muslims in those days. It seems like um, not long after that, the number of Muslims in Baba's immediate following uh, was diminished. Um, but in the 20s, there were quite a bunch. And also Hindus. So Hindus, Muslims, uh, Zoroastrians, who were um, well, pr pretty well educated and had good prospects in life, stuff like that. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that um, uh, you know, doing w this kind of work with gamalas was not what they were uh, accustomed to. And of course, Mayor Baba was instantly going to get over any kind of prejudices like that. They had not a ch such prejudices had not a chance of survival if you were one of Baba's mandali. So Gamala Yoga was a kind of a rueful, comic term for the sort of work Baba was getting them to do. You know, probably Dr. Ghani or somebody. In other words, it's not a yoga <laughs> in any conventional sense. So. Um, then in 1925, in January, Baba settled in for, uh, he made it his permanent ashram, it looked like, and that ran until November 1926. So that's the first long stay. You know, in early Maribad, from one year to another, there would be huge sea changes. So one year is nothing like another year. Like 19, some of you, a lot of you here would have known Asfendiar Vasali, right? A lot of you met Asfendiar. Well, that was 1927 to 1928. It was nothing like this 1926 at all. So big changes were, it was so dynamic around Baba and constantly um, he would have new phases and everything would be completely altered. So then there was a, a break 
in November of 1926, uh, where it looked like he was dissolving the ashram. It looks like it was finished. And I call it the Lenavla interlude. But then, in December 1926, he came back and started it all up again. And uh, this is the second long stay until May 1928. And uh, December 1928 through early 1920, oh, and May through December 1928, uh, Meher Baba moved the um, Mir Ashram uh, to uh, Toka, which is what, 40 kilometers away? Probably some of you have been to Toka. Little, little town on a river, a little bit uh, north of uh, Mirabad, Merzad. And uh, then he moved back in December and slowly began to dissolve the Meher Ashram and the Prem Ashram, which existed by that time, and uh, was, began to close things down. And that was really the, uh, uh, the end of the great early efflorescence of Mirabad. The focus really shifted. And in 1931, Baba went to the West for the first time. And that was a whole new phase that was opened up. This is then is the general framework of the um, period. Here are some, just some pictures. I'll go back to this in a minute. Any of you recognize that building? Actually, it's not. Oh, old Mondeley Hall, not not the main Mondeley Hall. The, yeah, so we yeah that's right. So this is uh, now it's called the Dharmshala. Um, you can see long wide horizons. Well, you can't see them now. For one thing, there there are all sorts of buildings that have gone up all over the place, and right here is where the new Mondeley Hall is. You know Mondeley Hall, Little Maribad. I'll show you a map in a, in a minute. But th that was built in 1948, much after this. But people still stay here. This is the Dharmshala. Pilgrims will uh, stay here. And this road is still there. It goes around, then comes up this way. And there's another road that goes around to that side. And in behind, you'll find the Rahuri cabin and the uh, Savage kitchen, which is a... I'm, I'm a savage, in fact, of, of that kitchen. Now this is, uh, in fact, let's take a look at the map. This is, okay. I know it's a little bit, I can expand it. But this is the, the highway. Go, this is going towards Ahmednagar, right? I'm hoping every, most of you have been there and will have some idea what we're talking about. And Aaron Gown will be up, up here, up this way. And uh, this is where that building we just looked at is. This building here is right there. We're calling it the old bungalow. Mondeley Hall now is there. Um, and uh, let me see. This is Galore Shah's tomb. Do you know Galore Shah's tomb? A saint who was buried there just before Baba came. And I think this is Padri's um, workshop. Or no, maybe it's not. Let me see if I can read that. It might be uh, the... Uh, yeah, no, th I was wrong. This is the... Uh, it's called the Upasni Sarai uh, which is a dharamshala. Do you know what a dharamshala is? It's a, um, uh, it's like a hostel for spiritual pilgrims. So if you're, in those days, if you were going to this, the tomb of a saint, the worshippers of that saint would create a little place where you could spend the night and have some food. So they had created this, named after, as you might divine, Upasni uh, Maharaj. And, um, Let's see, this is the, uh, um, I think that's the uh, table cabin, which is not located there now. This is the Jopari, you remember the Jopari, that little hut that was constructed very early during Baba's stay there, um, where he began his silence and did other things like that. And uh, so the table cabin was right by the road in those days. It got moved after a while. Of course, the pilgrim, the old pilgrim center, would be down here somewhere. 
um, like that. But here's the, what um, may be striking is that uh, a lot of the hub and center of Maribad in those days was across the road, actually, up here, um, which now is empty. Now there are historical markers telling you where these buildings were. Uh, but at that time, a lot of the life of Maribad was here. And these are the railway tracks right there. You probably remember the railway tracks. Um, but this is what was called the Sai Darbar. And it was kind of a big um, meeting hall. Um, they didn't have walls, just a sort of a very um, provisional kind of construction. Um, and uh, this is a little uh, seclusion cabin. We'll see photos of it in a minute, where Baba would go into seclusion. And he wrote some of the book there. He also wrote it in the table cabin. That was another place that he would use for that purpose. This is the Hazrat Babajan school building. This is what's called the post office. And do you know what happened to the post office? Any of you? They what? Did they take it for No, that's the Mananash uh, cabin. They built the samadhi. They built the samadhi. They tore it down and the stones were used for different things. But if you uh, see, uh, we'll look at uh, the post office in a second and uh, the look of the stones may be familiar. You'll see them right there at the samadhi. And uh, this is uh, what's called the Makanekas. Uh, which is the house of the chosen ones. Baba gave this name, honoring his disciples because it was their dormitory. It was the men's dormitory, basically. The post office in those days uh, was where uh, Mara and the women stayed. They, people shuffled around from one era to another. Uh, and this is like a little family quarters. This actually is the family quarters that has been moved onto this map from over here somewhere. Is where it's actually in the edge of Erangan. But to put it in the map, it was put there. So this is the uh, look of Lower Maribad, especially 1925. Actually, like the Sai Darbar got constructed between, I think, from May 1925. Uh, and was there for about a year. The Makanikas, likewise. Uh, so these buildings were built during this Gamala yoga phase, you know, uh, because they're, they really were carrying a lot of stuff in Gamalas and building buildings. And uh, also they had to clear out a lot of the underbrush and kill the scorpions and snakes and because it was kind of a uh, primitive place in those days. And so up the hill, um, this is uh, an image up the hill 1927-28 and the main point I'd want to make about it um, is that uh, the uh, hill was not really this much used in 1926. It really came into play the next year. In May of 1927, if you keep these years separate, um, the Baba started the Meher Ashram. And the Meher Ashram is the actual name of that boys' school um, where uh, Baba got s students from uh, Bombay and Iran and other places. Uh, to attend. And I keep mentioning Asfendiar Vasali because a lot of you uh, would have known them. Uh, Alaba also was in the Mir Ashram and a lot of other uh, uh, boys, some of them, the real stars of the period were people we never met, Chota Baba and Ali and so forth. Um, so it was really in 1927 that the hill became the focus because the schoolboys came, a bunch of them came in July of 1927. And uh, you know how Baba was when some new phase came along and Baba's attention was turned there, um, he would like forget everything else, it would seem like it. And so like, Baba, what about me, you know? <laughs> well, you just had to sort of, you know, roll with the punches on that. So um, 
the men, actually the women Mandali were feeling, Baba never sees us, he doesn't care about us anymore. There are all sorts of stories about that. And the, I think for the men it was the same, except that they were his hands and feet through whom he would do work. But he wasn't focusing his attention on them one bit. It was all in these school kids. And that led to uh, the uh, explosion I never know the good phrase for this, an explosion of love that happened in December, early January 27, 28, among some of these school kids. And uh, uh, that led to the creation of the Prem Ashram in 1928. So the hill was really the central locus for a lot of this. But that is really a phase after the Tiffin lectures. The Tiffin lectures, uh, the, these, uh, Boys were not in the picture. There are two, uh, two of these Tiffin lectures in August 1927, but all the rest are before that. So we're really in quite a different uh, phase in the Tiffin lectures, where the Mandali were Baba's focus, uh, very much. It's like Baba was really trying to, I don't know, get them up to speed and give them a training and the knowledge that they would need because then that was it. After that, they had to kind of come along for the ride and be useful and they could sit in on discourses if the discourse, if somebody else was there who Baba was discoursing to. And Baba would discourse to them too sometimes. But they were not the center of attention anymore. That was over. Um, really from about the middle of 1926 on, right here. Uh, there was this little, um, we'll have some pictures of it. They didn't have the domed structure yet. That was 1938. There was a little um, thatched kind of um, hut there. And it was very much a focus of Baba's work. He would go into the what's now the crypt and uh, would do seclusion work. In fact, in 1927, he was in there for a long period uh, doing seclusion and fasting. So right from the beginning, that was a, an important place. Um, the dome structure was constructed, uh, you know, in 38, uh, a good bit after this. I don't know who built it. Um, Padre could have been, but th th a lot of them were real hard, like Pendu. They were uh, hard workers, these guys.